from the research and innovation directorate so we uh we have intense who are innovators and we have the other other interested students who want to be innovators uh, so prof we invited you to give us uh, a talk about uh, social innovation i know this is a big thing uh for us especially in the humanities uh and uh we i i'm sure we are going to benefit a lot from your uh from you leading the discussion uh for everyone who is joining i'm sure most people will join us later they are we are continuing to come in that's a zoom for you so i want you to uh welcome uh our professor can I call you Kenneth because the same name I can't pronounce. <laughs> yeah. So he is the head of uh, the social and human sciences sector with UNESCO uh, uh, regional office for Southern Africa. Um, it's a, it's a, um, located here in, in Arare, for those of you who do not know. Uh, we have uh, worked uh, together before. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of us have collaborated with UNESCO in different uh, spheres. So UNESCO is, uh, I'm sure nobody want, uh, I would want an introduction to UNESCO. It's a, a UN uh, um, organization. So it's it's really uh, a part of uh, our us uh, um, with that prof can uh, give us a brief introduction of what he does and uh, he can then uh, talk to us about social innovation uh, thank you prof over to you I don't seem to see him. I think he has dropped. Dr. Namo, you are muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I think he is suffering from my problem of an unstable network. Let's see if he's going to rejoin us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, appeared like I did at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I had a power a power cut, but now it's back. Oh, shame. Sorry, uh, Prof. Can you please uh, make uh, uh, the professor a host so that he can share his screen? I can confirm that I can share already, so I have um, the authorization. Ah, all right, that's that, that's fantastic. So, Prof, I was talking about you already. I have introduced you, so you can go ahead and and uh, talk. Maybe you can give us a little bit about what you do, and then you can talk about uh, social innovation. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Namo, for your invitation, and I'm very pleased to to join this conversation and to engage with you, uh, students from the Innovation Hub of UZ. Um, I've had some couple of uh, exchanges with Dr. Namo um, uh, I mean, earlier last year, uh, and we have um, agreed that it has been, uh, it is very important for the Innovation Hub to really have an open mind uh, in considering and in working around the notion of innovation because oftentimes we think that innovation is essentially and primarily uh, about technologies uh, and, and te technical innovation, while also um, you know, the social dimensions and the anthropological dimensions could also help a lot in enlightening ourselves on the notion. So uh, today I, I will um, try to define the social innovation as it is understood by UNESCO. And I really look, look forward to engaging with you on, on sharing ideas and, and brainstorming around the, the, the concepts. So I'm Pini Chantalangsi. I'm the head of the social and human sciences sector at UNESCO 
Office for Southern Africa. Um, the social and human sciences sector in UNESCO is one of the five sectors. I know that you know most people know UNESCO for the cultural heritage sites and the um, heritage, cultural heritage um, program that we run. And also for the edu education sector, we have the UN organization dealing with education. But then also we have the S in UNESCO that stands for sciences. And sciences both um, as natural sciences, but also the social human sciences. And this is where I'm responsible of the program. Uh, our first mandate is to make sure that um, member states um, value and um, you know, pay attention to disciplines um, pertaining to social sciences, but also the humanities. We consider that these disciplines also have a very important role uh, and function in helping member states and countries develop uh, in a very inclusive and holistic manner. So this is where, you know, I'm speaking uh, to you now um, from the perspective of social human sciences sector feeding into development and helping countries to um, use the, the scientific knowledge that are available um, to articulate development program uh, on the ground. So colleagues, let, let me proceed now with um, the presentation that I thought I could share with you um, on the social innovation notions. First of all, let, let me say that social innovation is still a very blurred area. So no, no worries if you have still some hesitations, some confusion, some clarity on the notion, just be aware that globally, uh, this notion is still um, in the making, I would say, with some pilot experiences from here and there. But overall, it is a, still an open-ended notion um, let me try to introduce to you first the notion um, from a, a, a more macro level. And that macro level that I'm speaking to is about the notion of transitions. I, I'm sure that um, in your um, academic curriculum, but maybe also in your experiences, you have come across um, the notion of, of transitions that we are in today as a global community. First of all, of course, the transition from an industrial society to a knowledge and, and uh, uh, service economy. Uh, I know that SADC is still insisting a lot and even Zimbabwe also on industrialization, but we have to be aware that globally we are shifting from the industrial um, society with a certain model of economy towards a more um, knowledge-based and uh, service economy. Uh, this is also called sometimes knowledge society, as you know, whereby um, uh, services, but also knowledge and, and um, uh, expertise are valued also in the economic sector. We also have then have a transition also from individuals to networks. And the emergence, of course, of the um, uh, new technologies, um, new information and communication technologies have um, facilitated or have triggered or accelerated this transition towards networks um, uh, at the global level. We are now more and more engaged in di different and various networks in our professional and also um, academic uh, uh, stud and uh, curriculum. And um, these have, this will bring, uh, as I will show a bit later, some changes in the way we engage with each other and also with the states. We have also now transiting from a kind of welfare state to a more, uh, some kind of skepticism. So this is not really uh, academically uh, um, uh, evidenced, but what we can say is that, you know, from after in the aftermath of the Second World War, many countries have advocated for a model of 
welfare state, where the state really take care of uh, uh, population welfare through social protection, social uh, medical aid, for instance, system that has been crafted and created. But nowadays, we have been more skeptical about this model, also because of the demographic transition where you know, the, the youthful population will have to cater for an increasing um, uh, elderly population or, or retirees. And this is true, especially in Europe and in, in Northern America. But more, you know, all in all, this is a transition about the role of the state in general. Does the state have to cater for everything uh, in the society or we tend to lean towards more liberal or even sometimes neoliberal model of economy and, and, and uh, of political sciences. And of course, then let me finish with the last transition, which is um, this one, very huge one, which is the transition from growth, economic growth and material growth into what is called now uh, Anthropocene area era, sorry. And this is, of course, dealing with the climate change um, transition, where human societies have realized that they have a direct and significant impact on uh, climate change, on the environment. And this is what is called the Anthropocene, the, uh, the area, the era, the, the geolo geology, geological era, where human societies have direct impact on climate and on environment. So considering all these um, you know, macro transitions, um, then we can try to understand now the kind of new social practices um, that have been piloted in some parts of the world to aiming at, um, to aiming at meeting you know, the social needs in a better way or in a more efficient way with um, uh, more, you know, with new approaches. And um, let us consider three particular um, shift or changes. First one, that the first change is that the satisfaction of human needs that are not um, currently satisfied, either because not yet or because no longer perceived as important by either the market or the state. Now, let me say, I mean, let me um, advance a caveat here. This is not a position that is supported by UNESCO, but it is a description of the trends that we are witnessing. If you consider, for instance, the education sector, uh, including in Zimbabwe, um, you would see a kind of shift between, from, let's say, um, a state-driven education system whereby the public education is considered as a public uh, service delivered by states to the population. In the recent years, we have seen a lot of private um, entities, private universities, private uh, uh, schools being created and with states having less resources um, to a lot to uh, education sector. So this, is, this has created a lot of frustration. This has created also um, uh, a fundamental um, paradigm shift in the way state um, should be responsible or not of, of a public sector such as education. And you can take you know, other sectors such as health as well with shrinking economy, for instance, in Zimbabwe, then you can see private clinic coming up um, to, to fill the gap. So this is um, the first uh, description or trends uh, to say that human needs and sometimes very basic needs being uh, less well covered by state and opening the gap and opening the space for private initiatives to come in. The second change that I, wonder, I wanted to consider with you is the changes in the social relations especially with regard to governance that enable the above satisfaction, but also increase the level of participation of all, but especially of deprived groups of society. 
So the social, the new kind of social relations that are tested now is where you can see NGOs, um, CSOs, civil society organizations, but also sometimes community-led initiatives or groups come in to play uh, to, inter to interrogate the kind of bottom-up, you know, the kind of top-down um, uh, approach in, in how the state have been responding to the population's needs. And these groups are coming with more participatory, more inclusive, more bottom-up approaches that then indicate to the states that maybe the states or the national institutions need to listen more carefully and more attentively to practices that are coming from the ground. So this is a, a very important point where you can see civil society organizations coming in more strongly in the way they, they deal with citizens, but the way they relate to government as well. So let us bear in mind this shift. And the last one uh, is about increasing, uh, I mean, the social political uh, capability and access to resources that are needed to enhance right to satisfaction of human needs and participation. And this is really about the empowerment dimension. You know, since the, the states or the national um, institutions have less and less resources to cater for social needs, then there is also a question about how could um, resources be leveraged from other uh, stakeholders and, and from, from other sources. So this is also about uh, resources and budget and finance that we have to, to keep it at the back of our minds when considering social innovation. So in the nutshell, let me just share with you this um, graph where you can see, uh, let's say the, the, social, the, the ecosystem of, of social innovations. So in order for us to have social innovations, we need of course, to identify the social needs of the population, of the communities. We need also then to identify the institutional and financial limitations of state, which used to be the traditional provider of services to the community. And then lastly, but not least, we have to consider the technological evolution. And this is the uh, new technologies of information and communication that are available, that have been generalized and also uh, uh, make available to um, a lot of people uh, now, including in developing, country, in developing countries. So with these three um, ingredients, then it feeds into um, new ways of um, uh, responding to the social needs. It would feed into how NGOs and CSOs have been rethinking their approach and their services. And let me then emphasize on the results. What are the outcomes? Once we have all these needs, all these trends feeding into new practices um, tested and developed by CSOs, by youth organizations, by, by NGOs, and, and sometimes also by private sector, then we end up having also uh, significant changes in, 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 in three dimensions. First one is the civil society organizations are more empowered because they have now acquired more confidence, more, more trust from the community as well in the way they have been filling the gap where the states have failed to respond to the social needs. So, um, the, the civil society organizations and NGOs and associations have been empowered, um, including with um, the manipulation of new technologies of information and communication. You also have then the changes in social relations. I've touched upon it earlier. Uh, since civil society organizations have been empowered, have uh, tested some new approaches that are more promising, then they, they would negotiate another relation with the state. They will um, try to advocate or, or claim for more participation, for more inclusion 
in the way policies have been uh, implemented, in the way uh, social dialogues have been conducted. So they would be, you know, claiming for more role and for more rights in, in the processes that are uh, at hand. And then at the end of the day, uh, the change is also about cost effectiveness um, uh, matter. You know, with the new approaches, with the new uh, uh, models that have been tested, uh, sometimes we end up uh, having more cost effectiveness um, uh, in the new pilots, in the new models than in the traditional, you know, top down model that we have been used to. So let me proceed now with some, um, some examples, not from this side of the world, but from, from Northern Africa, where I was based before joining the UNESCO office in Harare. Let me share with you this example, which is um, drawn from a project that we've conducted with youth organizations looking into cultural heritage. As I mentioned earlier, UNESCO is of course well known for its um, program on culture heritage. So we have worked with um, uh, youth organizations that have been trying to see how they could um, better, in, better be involved in the way their cultural heritage have been safeguarded and protected and promoted. So this particular organization, which is called Morocco Pedia, Morocco stands for the country Morocco and Pedia coming from Wikipedia. What they have tried to do is to use their um, uh, networks to document um, on, on their um, uh, cultural heritage sites at their, at their community level. You know, it could be um, uh, a temple, it could be a mosque, it could be a, a church, or even a, a neglected uh, cultural sites that have not received enough attention from the states because the states have not identified such a site as being important with a, a national significance. But uh, for the community, that particular worship site, for instance, has a very strong uh, uh, importance for the collective memory, for uh, the community cohesion, for the social cohesion um, around that site. So these particular uh, youth networks have worked with the community to consult them, to interview them on the kind of collective memory that uh, community has developed over the years around particular cultural sites. And they have docu been documenting interviews you know, um, oral interviews, but also written um, uh, documentations from the community. And they have set up a, a, a great set of, um, of knowledge and data, which they then have shared and they have created what they call a Morocopedia, which is a kind of Wikipedia um, dedicated to um, cultural heritage sites, but documented from uh, the bottom from the community. They have shared all the interviews, recording, they have shared videos that they had produced um, with the community, um, you know, recalling their uh, personal or collective memory around a particular site. And all of these materials have been availed on, on the wiki, I mean, uh, Morocopedia widely. And that had triggered really a lot of interest from the population but also from the Ministry of Tourism. And after this initiative, the Ministry of Tourism has engaged with this particular youth-led organization to see how they could uh, leverage and, and tap into the resources that they have gathered on Morocopedia to use them to attract more tourism, to attract more tourists uh, coming to, into the country to visit the different sites uh, beyond the national um, classic and traditional you know, sites. They also wanted to, to make sure that um, uh, community level um, cultural sites are also available and attractive to tourists, thus generating income for the community. So 
uh, colleagues, this is just to, to, to show you an example of a very concrete um, initiative led by the community, in this case, youth organizations, engaging with the population at the, at the grassroots level, sharing it in an in a open uh, um, website, and then triggering uh, interest from the national stakeholder, which is the Ministry of Tourism in this case. So this illustrates, you know, the kind of relations, social relations that have changed, uh, rather than starting from the top, going to, to uh, downwards. Uh, in this case, it is an initiative that triggered, you know, interest from uh, the, the community up to uh, the Ministry of, of Tourism with very concrete uh, collaboration then starting from there. A similar uh, initiative uh, in Tunisia here, um, uh, uh, here again, a youth organization that have um, used their networks to document on neglected cultural sites at the community level and that have availed the data on the map here. You have a map on Tunisia and you can go you know, you can scroll and, and, and check out um, all the specific cultural sites that have not been listed and, and protected by the national authorities, but ha that, that have, um, um, you know, significant uh, significance for the communities. And you can find, you know, very detailed uh, description of the monuments, of the sites, and uh, here again, uh, after this, the publication of this site, the, Insti the National Institutes of, um, of uh, Heritage in Tunisia have taken, I mean, ha had got in touch with this um, particular association to also um, make use of the data that they have collected, but has not been uh, uh, deposited in the national repository of, um, of uh, national monuments. So this is again another example. Uh, I, I can continue with other example. This is another example from Tunisia where, and this is a, an interesting one. I mean, you know, Tunisia has un undergone a very profound um, political transition back in 2011 with what the so-called Arab revolutions. And since then, uh, from 2011 up to now, uh, the society has been uh, very, very um, uh, dynamic in innovating uh, the way citizens could engage with the state. And one of the gap that has been felt by civil society organizations is that many experts um, have been, have, have, have received a lot of training on governance, on, on uh, community development, they have become young experts uh, in, in the civil society organizations, but they have not been recognized as such. They have been neglected as being, you know, activists in uh, grassroots community level, in, in society of in civil society organizations, and, and even some some level of um, suspicion has developed between the state and these so-called activists. So to, to correct that uh, perception, uh, um, a, a platform has been uh, created and UNESCO has supported them in, in, in you know, coming up with very short video with young experts, jeune expert in French means uh, young experts, whereby the, mess the key message is to say, look at all these profile of young experts that has been um, that has acquired very solid skills in the various domains in governance, in economy, in health, in education, uh, and yet they have not been leveraged at the national level, uh, and at, especially at the government level. Government has not um, made any efforts to try to engage in dialogue with these associations with these experts have not uh, tried to um, involve them into consultation process on, on national policies. Um, and yet, 
and you, these resources and innovate, innovative thinking has been available for many years. Um, so this platform, for instance, we're aiming at connecting you know, these young experts with uh, government and national institutions to try to make, um, you know, to, to try to facilitate the, the interface between the two uh, worlds that tend to develop you know, suspicions uh, to one another. So this is also um, an initiative um, that has been proved uh, efficient in Tunisia. So I, I have just given you some um, three examples from um, um, Northern Africa. Let me conclude by sharing with you now um, a new initiative that UNESCO Regional Office has launched um, in January, which is about supporting youth engagement, participation, and social innovation in Southern Africa. So basically what we are trying to do is to, first of all, highlight and um, create visibility around the notion of social innovation, and secondly, we have worked with some youth organizations in the SADC region, so including Zimbabwe, but also Zambia, South Africa, and Namibia at the moment. We have um, consulted youth organizations that have been piloting some interesting initiatives, and we have tried to document these initiatives and share them in uh, a video that you can find available on UNESCO website. I will share with you the link in the chat box uh, immediately after my presentation. So um, we have created now this, um, this platform on our website and you will find two videos. One video is just documenting some examples of ideas of social innovations that youth organizations in the region would like to test, to scale up and to consolidate further um, with uh, support of, of partners um, of government, but also international partners. The second video is a video more of an advocacy video whereby UNESCO uh, regional director and also our partner, uh, Southern Africa Research and Documentation Center, SRGC, explain why uh, as a global institutions, we deem important to support such an initiative uh, uh, moving forward, upscale their initiative, um, uh, because we, we believe that it will change the way we, we engage with civil society, we engage with youth organizations, and the way we uh, try to harness on, on, on youth uh, social innovations to influence policies, to improve you know, uh, the way we think of uh, education, health, in a more innovative and more inclusive and more participatory manner. So colleagues, let me end here and, and open the floor for discussion because I think that would be uh, the most interesting part for us. But I will share with you then the link um, to our webpage uh, and I will invite you really to check out the materials and also to engage with us. We are really open to um, to, to hear from youth organizations, from students, from universities, on how we could work better together to try to pilot and scale up these uh, social innovations in a very concrete manner. As I have um, shown you in other regions, we have managed to really upscale uh, interesting initiatives and also link up the initiative with uh, government institutions uh, for more um, more efficient dialogues. And also let me um, emphasize on the fact that coming from you as um, UZ Innovation Hub, it will be very important if we can have you on board to, to you know, conduct any research piece or any um, uh, dialogue with uh, civil society organizations, because sometimes we have three worlds. We have government, we have civil society organizations, youth organizations, but even network of youth that are not even formalized, but are uh, conducting interesting ideas and, and work on the ground. And then we have universities or academia. And we have not managed at the moment to create an ecosystem connecting government, academia, and civil society organizations to come together 
and push forward and pilot ideas around social innovation. So this is something that is very concrete that needs to be done with your partnership as uh, UZ as well. All right, let me end there and thank you so much for your attention. Over to you. Um, oh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Um, I, I am going to abuse my uh, hosting uh, uh, responsibilities and uh, uh, begin with the uh, with giving you the comment and then ask my colleagues and students to comment later uh, i i i'm very uh, interested in this social innovation especially because it's bringing in a, a side to innovation that we may not have been uh, talking about so much but uh, at the same time it's uh, almost um working well with with what we have been uh we, we have already been doing uh my comment is that uh, um i think what social innovation uh is uh, doing is to throwing is to throw the the responsibility especially to 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 us uh, the, um, uh, institutions to the youth, especially with your, your initiatives to the youth uh, to really take up the responsibility of, uh, of uh, innovation and, uh, and uh, development of uh, communities, which I think is very important. Uh, and it is also, uh, if I may say, uh, why, part of the mandate of uh, universities, especially under our, our new uh, program uh, education 5.0 the mandate is to for the universities to respond to the needs of the society so i think uh, by taking up social innovation we would really be uh, fulfilling that mandate of taking up uh, the needs of the society and responding to them and doing something about them so i i i I like the, that that uh, aspect uh, uh, to social innovation, but uh, my my question is that um, uh, you you commented uh, uh, earlier on that uh, in terms of social innovation we are looking at at a global level we are looking at the transition from industrial to knowledge uh, based uh, economies. I I'm very interested in this because uh, here in Zimbabwe for now we are actually emphasizing industrialization. So uh, how do you see the fit uh, with social innovation in terms of us emphasizing uh, more on industrialization uh, uh, rather than knowledge, <laughs> knowledge uh, uh, generation? If you may comment on that. Bro. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Namo, for your question and remarks. Um, let me just indeed reflect on the industrial, uh, the transition from industrial society to knowledge society. And this is, this is a very, very um, macro consideration. Um, and it applies, of course, um, more particularly to um, develop uh, countries where you can see indeed um, you know, if you take a chart on, on, on the economy uh, evolution, you would see that in industries and, and primary sector have declined a lot and the service um, sector has um, increased um, significantly over the last, uh, you know, 50, 60 years. That's indicating that we have been shifting from um, heavy industrial uh, economy to a more service-oriented economy. So on top of that um, transition, we have seen for the last 30 years, uh, the shift towards uh, what is called now a knowledge society, which is societies that are uh, investing a lot on uh, research, on innovation and development. And of course, you will agree with me that um, if you take Northern America or Europe countries, they have I mean, the strength of, of their economy is, resides um, 
for a very significant part in the capacity to innovate, to research on innovation and make sure that their industry invests um, and are, are um, pioneering new approaches, new um, models, but even new um, uh, you know, types of uh, machines or new types of uh, car um, that are more you know, using renewable energy, for instance. So, I mean, industries are still there, but investments on innovation and research for development has significantly increased in many societies, thus influencing uh, a lot on, on the industrial, the classic industrial um, provision that we had so far. For the case of Zimbabwe and SADC uh, region, of course, we know that the SADC um, strategy, economic strategy is insisting a lot on in industrialization, and, and it is also the case for Zimbabwe. But then I always challenge, you know, colleagues in reflecting what does it mean uh, in, in the 21st century to insist on industrialization. Of course, we understand that the thrust behind it is to, of course, create more employment, to create more growth for the society and for the population, resulting in more social welfare and social benefits. But then at the same time, uh, you know, developing countries have the advantage of having seen already the lessons learned from, from developed countries where we can see that heavy investment on industry in the classical sense without um, investing on research for innovation and development has resulted sometimes to, uh, um, I mean, Unemployment. I mean, if you can take Europe uh, after the uh, crisis, I mean, the, the, the oil crisis in the 70s, many sectors have just been ruined uh, because they were not uh, sustainable anymore as an economic model. Uh, and rather, we are shifting now towards more uh, sustainable models using renewable energy, uh, making sure that uh, innovations on on uh, new models of uh, investment are, uh, are taken into account in the existing industry. So all in all, it means that while we are investing on industries and industrializations, we have to take care of, to take into account two things. One, the innovation uh, and learning from the past, learning from the um, Europe and North America experience and, and harnessing on the new technologies that are available, including the solar and renewable energies, for instance. And secondly, uh, climate change. I mean, we cannot continue um, as a country, as a region to um, neglect or ignore the uh, Paris Convention anymore because any, every one of us have ratified the convention and in the couple of decades ahead of us, we will be required to reduce our carbon emission. That's also um, mean, meaning that we need to rethink our industrial models. So over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Namo. It has been a bit long, but I, I thought it was important to you know, discriminate between um, uh, industries, service economy, and then knowledge society that needs to be considered you know, together in a holistic manner. Over. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, I will open the discussion. Any comments uh, from colleagues? Prof Chifamba. No, thank you, Prof. Um, excellent presentation. Challenging to our students. I don't have anything to add. Um, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Uh, uh, Jiri. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. And uh, thanks, Dr. Namo. I think the if, if, if my, my little comment is that uh, this is very good. Um, and trying to bridge the gap that has been there 
between sciences and uh, social sciences. And um, the, the, I think that gap will always be there where you will see social sciences really becoming more and more relevant in terms of innovation. And uh, my little understanding is that most of the innovation that has come, that has come from science is really find it difficult to go out there because they forget the social aspect. And this then uh, is a very, very critical effort and uh, important work to try and uh, bridge that, that, that gap that is there. So yeah, uh, this is always there. But I think the important thing is to 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 and the work is really in trying to infuse the social aspects and social innovations into what has been generally accepted as innovations in terms of science. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, Prof. And uh, thank you, Dr. Namo as well. Uh, you are welcome, Prof. Uh, uh, I think our time is uh, limited now, so I would want to really uh, uh, convey our uh, collective uh, gratitude to, to Professor. Uh, I think this is the beginning uh, or the uh, mid of a, a, a journey where we will uh, work with uh, um, UNESCO and for our, our intents, uh, you can always talk to us and uh, if you want to engage uh, UNESCO in a way that the university can assist, we can always uh, do that. Uh, as you heard from uh, our Prof, uh, uh, UNESCO is open to engagement and we are going to take advantage of that. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Thanks everyone for, uh, for listening and uh, uh, engaging with us. Uh, maybe we can uh, uh, unmute and thank the professor in our uh, traditional way. <laughs> thank, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. This has been very inspiring, and I hope that uh, I, I will hear from you moving forward because we are also very, very uh, curious to know what kind of project you are um, uh, researching on or you are piloting. And please feel free to really reach out to us. Uh, we are very, very uh, looking forward to support you. And in the meantime, feel free to check out the, the website on social innovation and help us share the ideas and the campaigns around the notion as well. Thank you, Dr. Namo, and thank you to all colleagues for the invitation. Thank you so Good much. Good afternoon. Yeah.